Welcome back everybody, Professor G here. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the 100 schools of thought. These are the different uh, schools slash philosophies slash religions uh, that develop out of the Warring States period in Chinese history. So uh, most, so typically speaking, it's, it's hard to give these a label. Um, it's referred to as the 100 schools uh, not because there's literally 100 different schools, but rather because this is a time period of the emergence of several different ways of thinking within Chinese history. We're going to talk about three of these ways here. And I say these are Chinese philosophy. This is Chinese philosophy. Um, but philosophy in China uh, means something different than it does here in the West. So philosophy in the West begins with ancient Greece, begins with ancient Greek people, um, begins with uh, ancient Greek philosophers like Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, uh, people that you may have heard of before. Uh, Thales is traditionally considered the first philosopher. Um, but in the West, philosophy is separate from religion. And philosophy is separate from uh, theology, and sometimes it's even considered separate, nowadays, it's considered separate from politics. Um, in Chinese philosophy, there's really not that distinction. So, for example, uh, legalism and Confucianism are going to have some very important political aspects to them. In fact, legalism is would be would we would we would consider to be a political doctrine uh, rather than a philosophy okay so there's no clear distinction in Chinese thought uh, between these different groups between philosophy religion and politics they're all just kind of brought together and kind of mushed together in a system that incorporates all these different aspects of social reality but there is a connection here and the connection seems to be that Chinese philosophy is very centered on what we would call humanism. It's very humanistic in its approach. And humanism, as the name suggests, is the study of or the study from the perspective of humanity, the focus on humanity. And you may say, well, what other focus is there, right? Um, Humanism is an approach to ethics, and it's an approach to philosophy, to religion, that centers on us. Have you ever heard the expression, man is the measure of all things? This is, humanist, this is humanistic, this is humanism, okay? So when I say that Chinese philosophy is humanistic, I mean, for example, that legalism and Confucianism are going to be focused on human problems rather than focused on the divine are focused on religion. And this is kind of odd because some people consider Confucianism to be a religion. And they're kind of right, but the focus is on how we should act, how we should behave, and the structure of society. It's much different from, say, uh, Christianity, um, which is very sort of abstract in its approach. Right? Christian theologians talk about the nature of God, the nature of the Trinity, uh, the meaning of holiness, of sin, all these sort of abstract concepts, right? That's not quite what we see here. And this is why we say it's humanistic. Okay, so let's talk about uh, three of these different schools. First up, we have the school of legalism. Now, remember, we're talking about this within a historical context. So we're talking about uh, the development of legalism during the Warring States period. The Warring States period, remember, it comes after the fall of the Zhao dynasty. After the fall of the Zhao, there's a power vacuum that's created within mainland China. And you have these eight or nine different competing states and cities that are competing for control of China as a whole. And so what happens is you have these different schools that come about to see, that, that seek to answer different questions. And one of the most important questions during this time period is, well, what sort of government should we have? What's the best form of government? How do you best rule your people? 
This was important because the Chinese at the time were experimenting. Uh, monarchy had essentially fa uh, fallen. Uh, the Zhou were unable to control China with the system of government that they had implemented. And so people were looking for new solutions to this problem. And legalism is one of those solutions. Now, legalism is tradi traditionally traced uh, to a man named Hong Fei Zi, who was a scholar and who was credited with founding legalism in China. And legalism, as the name suggests, if you want to sort of keep it clear in your mind, think legalism, law, legal law. Legalism is all about law and rule. Legalism is about, it's very, it's very heavy handed in its approach. The idea is that you want to enforce strong laws on your people to get them to obey you. Right, so the style of government that results from legalism is very authoritarian. It's very, um, very harsh, I guess is what we would say, right? A lot of rules and dictates concerning what you can and can't do, okay? And the reason for this, okay, so when I said that there's not like a real distinction between politics and philosophy, Okay, so Han Fei Zi, he says that the reason for this, he bases in human nature. He bases it in our basic human condition. And Han Fei, Han Fei Zi has a lot of speculations about what we as human beings are like. And Han Fei Zi says um, that we as humans are selfish, uh, greedy, and that basically we are always looking after number one. We're always looking after ourselves, and we're always looking for ways to better ourselves, no matter what the cost. So if I can get rich by stealing from my neighbor, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna steal from my neighbor. Uh, if I can get a promotion in my job by killing my boss, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna kill my boss, okay? So human nature, according to legalism, is corrupt. And because human nature can, is corrupt, we as human beings are kind of like children. We don't know what is best for ourselves because we're just so selfish and greedy that we just grab whatever comes to us. And like children, we have to be managed. Okay, children have to be kept in place. They're, they can't just be free to roam around because they're gonna do, start doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And legalism says the things, same thing about us, that there has to be laws implemented in order, for, in order that people know how to behave. People have to clearly know what they can and cannot do. They have to be told directly. They have to have, they have, to have very strict limits placed on their world, placed on what they are capable of doing. And so legalism says that you enforce this politically at a governmental level, a top-down approach that people should be controlled with law. And another implication of this is that you have to have a very strong police force slash military in order to make people obey, typically with strict punishment. So next up, we have Confucianism. Confucianism being based on the teachings and the writings of Confucius. Um, most notably, you'll have selections to read from Confucius's Analects. This is one of his most popular works. And Confucius introduces some very interesting ideas within Chinese philosophy. Again, Confucianism is sometimes considered a religion. I would classify it more as a sort of comprehensive worldview. Confucius doesn't really have that much to say about the gods, with, or the god, what traditional religion is usually concerned with. Confucius isn't really interested in those sorts of theological questions. He doesn't oppose them. He doesn't think that they're wrong or that the gods don't exist or anything like that. He says, yeah, practice religion, do your sacrifices, honor the ancestors, but Confucius is more concerned with practical issues, how I should act in my day-to-day -day life. And there are three central virtues of Confucianism, three sort of central ethical ideas that are at the heart of Confucianism. 
Now, in your, in your selections from the analytics, he'll talk about all three of these, and he'll talk about what they mean, and so I just want to briefly go over this real quick with you. First of all, and probably the central idea of Confucianism is this notion of filial piety. Filial piety. Now, filial piety um, refers to kind of honor and respect of your parents, devotion and obedience to your parents. Your parents raised you, they gave birth to you, they gave you the best life that they possibly could, and your role as a child and their role as child to their grandparents is to take care of their parents, to honor their parents' requests, and to do what their parents command. This is what's referred to as filial piety. So Confucianism is, it's really centered around the household. Most of what Confucius has to say has to deal with the relationship between parents and their children at the, all the different generational levels. And Confucius sees the relationship between parents and their children as sort of the bedrock of society. Confucius says, if you have good relationships between your parents and your children, then guess what? You're going to have a good government, a good society, a good group of people. Because the relationship between parents and the children is the basis, according to Confucius, is the basis of all morality. And filial piety is the primary example of this. So within Confucian thought, a, a child is to do whatever the parent says, a child is to take care of the parent, is to feed the parent, is to uh, obey the parent's commands about their own life, to listen to what their parents have to say and to follow those commands. So, but then Confucius has a caveat here, right? So suppose my mother says, I want you to go to law school. Obviously I did it, that's why I'm here teaching history, but my mother didn't want me to go to law school, but suppose that she did, suppose she says, I really want you to go to law school. Filial piety would be me obeying her command. Me saying, oh yeah, okay, I'll go be a lawyer then. But as you and I know, I can do this begr uh, begrudgingly, right? I may not be very happy with this decision. I might still do it, but deep down inside, I might not really want to do it. So my mom says, go to law school. I say, okay, I, I guess so. And I just kind of uh, half-ass my way through law school. I don't really pay attention to the class. And I just do sort of the minimal effort until I complete law school to make my mother happy. Well, for Confucius, this is where Ren comes in. So we have this idea of Ren and Li. Li is the physical action. Li just means ritual, the, the action that the person performs. So going to law school is Li, is obeying my mother's commands. That's Li. Rin roughly translates to humaneness. It's kind of an odd translation. Rin means um, humaneness slash compassion. Rin is the principle. So going back to this example, my mom says go to law school. Rin would be not just obeying her commands, but willfully and joyfully obeying her commands. So I don't say, well, I guess I'll go to law school. I'll say, you know what, Mom? I, I really don't think that's a good idea, but let me think about it. And so I come back and I say, after much thought, that's, that's a great idea. That's going to give me a good future. You're looking out for my best interest. I'm going to do it. So Rin refers to doing a moral action, not just out of like a zombie-like quality, but doing it because you know it's the right thing to do. So Rin is this idea, is in, in Rin is what really gives moral actions their worth. It what, it's what makes an action worthwhile. Because if I help my parents and I do it with my teeth clenched and I'm really cussing them under my breath the whole time, I'm not really doing anything good. But if I do it even though I don't want to do it, and if I do it with as much compassion and as, with as much humbleness as I can, this is what Confucius means when he says Ren. 
And he says that we should perform all of our actions from Rim. So, moving on to Taoism, we have a really big shift here. Because both, both legalism and Confucianism are very humanistic, right? They're very concerned with how we act and how this is reflected at a governmental level. Not so much with Taoism. You can kind of see Taoism as a sort of a rejection of both legalism and Confucianism. Now, it doesn't say that they're wrong, but Taoism says that these miss the point in a way. This is Taoism's, well, let me say this. Taoism is very, very difficult to understand. I, I read stuff on it constantly in order to make sure that I'm telling you the correct stuff, but I'm probably going to get some stuff wrong because Taoism is very complex and it's very abstract. Where legalism and Confucianism are concerned with human action, Taoism, not so much. And perhaps most importantly, Taoism doesn't really care about politics. In fact, Taoism sees politics as a sort of corruption of nature. We'll get to this here in a second. So there's some very uh, important characteristics of Taoism. Taoism is more like a traditional religion, like we would think of religion. Like uh, religion being that you go to church, you worship, you pray, maybe you offer a sacrifice or you do some sort of meditation or some sort of ritualistic lighting of the candles. This is more akin to Taoism, okay? So Taoism is characterized by its positive attitude towards metaphysics and the occult. Taoists believe in many gods, multiple gods and spirits and entities. And when I say occult, don't think of like spooky, like ghost stories, uh, witches and Satanism type of cult. Okay, occult is, well, we talked about magic. Occult is magical rituals, right? Occult is the, the carrying out of those rituals, uh, lighting candles, making sacrifices, doing various ritualistic acts in order to get divine aid. This is the occult. So Taoism has a positive attitude towards metaphysics and the occult. So it incorporates a lot of traditional Chinese beliefs. Chinese beliefs in uh, spirits and in ancestor worship and in ancestor spirits. Okay, Taoism is going to be very receptive of that. Legalism, no. And Confucius, just says, whatever, do what you want, as far as that goes, I don't care, right? But Taoism says, no, this is a good thing. This is something that we ought to do. So a positive attitude towards metaphysics and the occult, and you can see this if you, uh, for example, if you look up if you look up Taoism today, it's still around, it's, it's mainly prevalent, um, especially in places like Taiwan, okay? And you can see them doing their rituals. But the rituals are not just like magical rituals, but one of the purposes of Taoism is to, it's not really about right belief. This gets back to the humanist, or the, the uh, humanism that kind of unites all these schools. It's not, Taoism isn't really concerned about like correct belief about the gods as much as correct belief about yourself. Taoism is very holistic. Right? If you ever heard of the notion of like chi, for example, this like bodily energy that we have, it's the basis of like acupuncture, right? They, they poke your chi points. Um, Taoists believe that, getting on to the second point here, Taoists believe in a deep connection between nature and humanity. And part of this correction is that we want to get back to nature, to make ourselves get back to this sort of natural, pristine condition. And part of this is exercises in maintaining and influencing your chi. This is kind of the connection here between the occult aspect and um, the sort of humanistic aspect. So practices such as like Tai Chi, Practices such as acupuncture are all rooted in this idea that we have to realign our, our chi, our energy. And 
nowadays we, we understand this to be more like spiritual. Maybe some people interpret it metaphorical, right? But the idea is to realign your chi, to, to get back to the pristine tradition, uh, to get back to the real you, because, because nature or things that are unnatural, things that are unnatural being primarily civilization, everything that civilization entail, entails corrupts us. That we are essentially living in an artificial environment that is not where we belong. We belong in nature. And another central aspect of Taoism is this notion of the Tao itself. And you'll read about the Tao when you read those selections from the Tao Te Ching. And the Tao is this sort of underlying principle of reality. The Tao flows through all things. This, again, this is getting back to this whole nature and holistic approach. And everything eventually returns to the Tao. Now this is very abstract and obtuse and it's very hard to stand, but, but read those selections and think about it within this context. Okay, the Tao is, is unknowable. We can't really talk about it, we can't describe it because it's just too big. It's, it's just too large to understand, all right? So that's all I got for today, folks. Again, email me if you have any questions.